Kia ora koutou, me karakia tātou. Whakatakati hau ki te uru, whakatakati hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai. E hia ki ana te atakura he teo, he huka, he hauhu, te hei mauri ora. Tēnā tātou katoa, no mai hari mai ki tēnei hui ata, welcome to our webinar. Um, ko Moira Kaluni toko ingoa, um, Moira, the project lead at Tingaka Kahukura, we're collaborating with Intersex Aotearoa on this webinar series. Welcome to around about 250 of you who are joining us today and um, welcome to those of you who are watching the recording afterwards. I'll pass over to my colleague Joey to introduce our session today. Kia ora Moira, thank you and kia ora koutou. It is so great to have you all with us today. I think more and more people are joining all the time. Um, we're going to get straight into this one. So let's just let's just hit the ground running this is going to be a webinar about intersex health presented by intersex aotearoa and tingako kahukura it's part of a series that we are running so the first one was last year towards the end of the year particularly for med students about intersex health and if you are a med student please go and watch that recording because it was really aimed directly at you um, but this is broadly for anyone working in healthcare at this point we're going to run another one on thursday about trans health which i know a lot of you have signed up for so that's exciting um we're more about that towards the end of this session. We'd also like to thank the Council of Medical Colleges and the New Zealand Medical Students Association for meeting with us, talking about this webinar series. We're excited for those relationships and for the promotion that you did for us to get such a great audience here today. Um, this is going to be not a 101, so be prepared. This is a deep dive. <laughs> this is like intersex health, human rights, concepts of informed consent, um, the history, where we are now, it's, it's all in there. If you need 101 resources, we have links to those as well, but we're going to be kind of moving through that part pretty fast and getting into some uh, deeper stuff. We really think that you all have a role to play in the transformation of our health system and especially today, talking about how that is in response to the needs of intersex people, um, our health system needs to change. So we want community and social supports to be recognised as part of that, um, the healthcare options that people need, you know, and we're here to support all of you to figure out what that might look like in practice. I'm going to ask um, Jelly and Moira to introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll move into the presentation and hopefully have some room for chats at the end. Um, we also have Jono in the chat, and you may notice I'm talking really fast because we do have a lot to get through, but I'm going to hand over to Jelly to introduce yourself first, and then we'll go from there. Kia ora. Uh, thanks, Joey. Kia ora ite whanau. Um, really want to thank uh, Tanako Kahukura for um, making it possible to support this. It's really awesome. Um, Intersex Aotearoa are a fierce but small organisation. Um, and I'm the Community um, and Communications Project Manager. I'm based in Te Whanganui Atara, originally born in Otipoti, Dunedin. Um, yeah, it's really wonderful to be here today and I'm excited to get stuck into it. Kia ora. Kia ora, Jelly. Moira. Kia ora, and Kumoya Kluni Tuku Ingwa. Um, I am based in Tamaki Makoto in Mount Eden in Auckland um, and, and project lead at Tingako Kahukura. So, our work is around trying to um, create an Aotearoa where rainbow people, intersex people, trans people grow up feeling safe, supported, feeling like they belong and have a place in all the spaces where they live and learn and work and access healthcare and social support. So that's me working alongside Joey and Jono. And I'll hand back to Joey, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Kia ora. Kia ora. So I'm Joey. I'm the education lead for Tingako Kahukura. I think a lot of you have probably been to our webinars before. Um, so you probably know something about how this goes. We've got our colleague Jono in the chat. And please feel free to use the chat as much as you want to as well. Um, what do, do I want to say anything introducing myself? I'm based in Tamaki Makoto out west. I'm a Pākehā person with Scottish and English ancestry mostly. My pronouns are they, them, and um, I'm excited to get into this. We also have the Q&A function, and if you want to ask questions anonymously, then the Q&A function will let you do that. Uh, we don't need you to use it, but you can if you want to. You can also just pop any comments you like as we go along into that chat box. We would love to know if what Jelly is sharing and what the conversation kind of goes through hits on the things that you're wanting us to talk about. Like, are we really getting to the questions that you have? And we will only know that if you tell us. So please, if you're watching this live, 
tell us your thoughts as you go along. Be mindful this is being recorded and it is gonna be publicly available later people won't be able to see what you put in the chat, but we may change the wording of whatever you put in there if we think we need to, to be able to bring a question to Jelly in a totally anonymized way. We do ask that you don't share information about specific people as part of that um, privacy and confidentiality are, as we're gonna hear, particularly important. Yes, okay, I think that's all I needed to cover. Any other housekeeping things from anyone? No, all right. Jelly, you are up. Sharing screen now. Oh, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. So today, of course, um, we're talking about a human rights approach to healthcare for intersex communities. Um, unfortunately, this means I will be sharing experiences from people who have undergone medical interventions and some without their informed consent. Um, just taking note that some of this information may be hard to hear, take care and take a break if needed. And, you know, we talked about before this uh, uh, principles and values we have of, of why it's so important to share this work. So um, just to underline those, you know, we're, we're going to be speaking today about a patient's autonomy over their own body and well-being informed consent, um, the removal of negative framings and pathologizing concepts within healthcare, and looking at introducing holistic understandings of health and well-being, um, and just all and any reform developed with and led by communities that you seek to serve. And yep, Joey's already spoken to the questions, uh, Q&A, um, portals that you can engage with. And I really just want to say that this is intended to be a place of learning. So let's say there's no silly questions. And I get that a lot of the, the terms and jargon might be new to you. So just please, there's no right words. Um, so if you hear a new word or a term and want to know more, ask us. If you get to the end and think that we haven't covered an idea enough, um, please reach out. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So creating systems change across healthcare. We've got a quote here saying, we have the same range of health needs as everyone else, and we need a healthcare system that is competent, safe, and respectful. Um, and so then we've got lead the change, shift the paradigm, and what's next after cultural safety. We will be covering some of those today. So what do we mean when we use the term intersex? <laughs> This is no simple word. So intersex is an umbrella term that provides a catch-all to describe innate variations in sex characteristics. So sex characteristics, we all have them. They include a person's chromosomes, genitals, reproductive systems, gonads, hormone sensitivity, and production. During this time, I will use intersex person, intersex variation, and VSC interchangeably. And this is important because there's no one way that people describe themselves. So the key around thinking about intersex variations is that, is that they are innate, so otherwise natural or born with. So in medical terms, a person with an intersex variation has innate variations of sex characteristics. And then, so to be born with innate typical sex characteristics, the term we use is endosex. Now, <clears throat> Excuse me. The medical pathology may classify only certain types of variations as intersex, those which are considered as truly between sexes. Um, so examples of such variations are here, 46XX, 46XY, and true gonadal intersex. And I bring this up because the term intersex can be a tool to really bring us all together. But when these hierarchies are created by a medical pathology, this can lead to further isolation of ind individuals with diverse bodies, both sitting within and outside of specific diagnoses. So what we're really, really wanting to say is words matter and the way you use them is important. Speaking of how we use them, in medical settings, you might hear some of these terms being used, which predominantly might be 
we've already introduced intersex, intersexual and variations of sex characteristics, but you're probably more likely to hear disorders of sex development or differences of sex development, DSD. Um, and historically, hermaphrodite was a common word. Um, also including atypical sex anatomies, doubtful sex, mutations, conditions, and abnormalities. And here we've got objections to the language of disorders of sex development began immediately after it was clinically adopted in 2006 and have continued to the present time. So I've got a little asterisk there next to hermaphrodite just to say that there are actually some people within the community that have reclaimed that word, but like any sensitive terms that have been reclaimed, it's really important that those are used by people with lived experience. And at the bottom of the screen here, here's the sort of jargon that we're dealing with. Um, many of you across healthcare will be familiar with some of the elements of these terms, um, but just imagine being presented with one of these as a community member. So the scale of what we're talking about is there's no one way to be intersex. There are up to 40 different variations known, occurring in approximately 1.7 to 2.3% of that population. So that variation in the in the stats there, 1.7 to 2.3, harks back to what I was talking about, about there being hierarchies. Um, and so 1.7 is the conservative number that doesn't include some of these variations on the screen, including, for example, hyperspadius. So 2.3, still conservative, but includes um, a broader range of variations in sex characteristics. Now, it's important to recognize that each individual's experience and journey will be unique and different. So for some people, they're born with a certain intersex variation that has visible traits. And I think this is what a lot of people think of when they imagine an intersex baby as an infant with clearly visible variations. Um, and of course, this will make people more susceptible to pathologization and intervention as infants. But for others, their variation in sex characteristics may not become apparent until during or after puberty. And this is another significant period for medical intervention. Um, and for some, Variations may not be identified, identified until much later, perhaps during fertility treatment. And for others, they may never receive a diagnosis at all. So we talked at the start about shifting the para paradigm. What we need to know now is where has this all come from? So we've got a quote here, intersex individuals have been pathologized by the medical profession's insistence on a strict binary model of sex, gender, and sexuality. This is true in the past and in the contemporary context. So prior to World War II, there's um, documentation of adults with intersex variations seeking out medical options. And they were doing this through um, gender affirming clinics, in the UK and Germany. We see um, a rise in such techniques after the war. Um, and as well, vast social change, obviously through um, fascism and a lot of destruction of those gender affirming clinics. So so-called sex change operations between the 1930s and 1950s were becoming more controversial at a time while intersex surgeries were becoming more routine. And this includes the removal of healthy gonadal and genital tissue. And so it's with these new surgical technologies emerging that by the 1940s, a new specialty was developed, and that is pediatric urology. But it all comes together in the 1950s with the psychologist, Dr. John Money, and he published guidelines that recommended early surgical intervention on genitals that did not conform to normative constructs of what male and female genitals should look like. Dr. Money recommended consistent rearing in one corresponding gender. So Dr. Money recommended surgery in order to study the psychology of gender, and his findings have influenced modern, modern medical practices. However, he did believe that it was important to reinforce traditional male and female bodies and behaviors, 
And we can see this still present in current medical protocols. Now we have here um, a doctor who has keenly picked up Dr. Money's recommendations and has said, as a result of operative treatment, it has been discovered that these patients show not only a general and immediate tendency to lose their acquired male characters and to revert to their normal female ones, but also to return to normal sexuality psych psychologically when this has been abnormal before operation. So what we're seeing is an interventionist approach that is actually saying, if you've got a queer body, you could result with a queer mind or, or queer behaviors. So if we correct the body, then we correct behavior. Um, and so obviously these outdated ideas from the 1950s promote unrealistic body standards and conformity. The results of these processes are that those with inter intersex variations are made to bear the brunt of man's demand of order over nature. So, okay, I found this on the web for if treatment has been discovered that these patients so not only a general and immediate tendency to lose their acquired male characters and to revert to their normal female ones, but also to return to normal. Oh my goodness, life. Jelly. I think that that was a, an automatic search thing that got activated. Um, and I'm so sorry, that was you. Siri taking over my computer. <laughs> Siri, be quiet. I have to say, we're hearing from. <laughs> okay, I think I've stopped that now. We want to hear from you, Jelly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Apologies. Okay. All good, all good. Um, so I was saying that this idea that we could protect people through surgical intervention is driven by a societal norm that influence is influenced by bias. And and the sort of sad complexity of that is that it's driven by the fear that individuals with variations of sex characteristics would face social exclusion if they were allowed to remain in their natural state. So we can understand those motivations, right? But if med medical interventions are pre presented as a means of protecting individuals from a world that may struggle to accept them as they naturally are, then we see this idea of the fragility of childhood child psychological development as being used as a justification for early intervention. And on top of that, we've got parental anxiety mixed in and then being invoked as a threat to psychological development and one which surgery on the child can manage. So there's, there's drivers here that are creating a, a, a perfect storm in a way. And and so this process, we've got pre and post-war development, and we've got a 1950s um, sort of impetus to define what normal is. This means that now we've got specialist roles that have resulted in improved surgical techniques, and they're being applied within gynecolog gynecology, endocrinology, and pediatrics for DSDs due to the gathering momentum of activism and survivors in the 1990s. Yet there is still a lack of addressing any underlying health implications of what it means physiologically to have an intersex variation, as well as ignoring the mental and physical harms that can come from interventionist protocol. And a continuation of the normalization of genitals, and unfortunately with an emphasis on people being able to inform, perform heteronormative sex, with a focus on fertility being the dominant motivation within healthcare and from parents. And all of this is happening um, most often with interventions occurring on those who cannot give informed consent, um, including our tamariki and rangatahi. And I just want to hold that point there um, that informed consent means having all the information. So, um, you know, it's, it's not saying that people can't give informed consent um, is that they're not given the, the appropriate information. And we've got a quote here from someone who says, it took me so long to understand that what was wrong with my body wasn't just a medical problem, but that mostly it was about making sure my teenage body could, well, you know, have sex with a penis. 
but my mum and I weren't really told that at the time. We weren't told a lot. As soon as it was diagnosed, it was like everything sped up. And now I am left with all the scar tissue, prolapse and incontinence. And for what? Who was this all for? I know my mum feels guilty, but we both didn't understand what was happening and why. Now the irony is, I do have real medical problems that were either ignored or created by the normalizing surgeries themselves. And we've got to ask ourselves the question, if 1.7 to 2.3% of the population have a variation in sex characteristics, then what is normal? So here's a, a visual diagram of the health care approach that is set up today. And we've got um, clearly a dominant model with clinicians and specialists. Um, and then they're working directly with parents, caregivers, and whānau. Um, and then there's the individual with an intersex variation, smaller below. And and the way that works is that it's it's clearly operating in a silo. Um, we've got a concealment model, which which holds the idea that you know, of course, some of these discussions are really private, and they're up to the individual. Privacy and confidentiality is really important. Um, but there's a difference between that and the idea of keeping intersex variations hidden, because that can, of course, induce the feeling of shame and negativity, negatively <laughs> affect the well-being of both individuals and families. If information is with withheld, this can also harm familial relationships in the long term. We've got another um, quote here from an uh, intersex person who's 29 now, but said, when me and my parents were first told, we were recommended to keep it quiet. As I lived in a small town and the doctor said it wouldn't be good to share the news. Others wouldn't understand. He also said that I would never meet anyone else like me. It was the most lonely and isolated time of my life, probably for my parents too, until I found support online and I realized I was not the only one and that people all around the world had had the same experience as me. Another example here, um, passed on to a peer support worker this year. Only this year, a new parent reached out through the parent support group to get help and advice for her newborn with a VSC. She had been told in that South Island hospital that there was no support groups or anyone she could talk to in New Zealand about her baby's intersex variation. So if that's the case, we've got a, a young parent um, wanting support, wanting to know as much as possible and the only only person she's in contact with is this you know whoever is giving her the the information at the south island hospital and so as i've already shared this type of support is based on heteronormative ideals and does not address the underlying social stigma associated with differences Using medical treatments to address social discomfort is not an appropriate approach. You know, one suggestion for supporting individuals who are perceived as different is to provide psychological support to prevent bullying and social isolation. Um, and instead, of course, we should focus on promoting positive educational awareness to help and reduce social stigma and celebrate diversity. It's not fair to put the burden of adapting to a social problem on individuals. Society as a whole should work to address and overcome the problem instead. And we can recommend um, what that might look like through um, what, what is known as a holistic understanding of healthcare and well-being. Um, and this is where shifting the paradigm can happen. So we've got uh, a person with a variation of sex characteristics clearly in the center. Um, and they're being fed information um, and support by multiple spaces. And this diagram, um, they're not working directly with an intersex-led organization, but that organization is providing information to the therapeutic support and the peer support groups. Um, and also the extended whānau seem to be taking a key role with specialists and that person with a variation of sex characteristics as a support role. And 
So there's not only just the clinician, there's also sexual health support, their GPs involved, um, and they're getting um, psychosocial care. So this shows that healthcare has shifted into a balanced um, a circle of wraparound support, um, and that's just one component of a greater care model. I just wanted to step back into a, a kind of a wider sphere of understanding here and just talk briefly about where this all sits. So an underpinning of um, the way that we work is with a human rights lens um, and the way to understand sex characteristics alongside a bunch of other really important things is to use the SOGESC model or sexual orientation, gender identity and expression and sex characteristics. So this framework clearly shows the spectrum of experience and being within a person's sexuality, gender and sex characteristics. Um, and this framing can be helpful to understand, to start to separate areas where discrimination specifically can occur. And, you know, there's been a lot of conflation in the way that our categorization systems have and still continue to record sex and gender interchangeably. And this has led to a bit of confusion and a lack of distinction. And I do, do need to note here that's, that sometimes the term sex has been weaponized by people who use biological essentialism to exclude transgender communities. So by using sex characteristics and acknowledging we all have those, um, we can bring inclusive understandings of our bodies and recognize the diversity of our sex characteristics instead of thinking in just binary terms. And how does this all sit in other spaces like the rainbow, as we call it here, or the I and LGBTQIA? So intersex um, has been used since the 90s when it was replacing the term hermaphrodite. Um, and then shortly after that, it was added to the acronym of the LGBT along with queer and trans communities. And this is because that activism has always fought for the rights of people who fall outside of expected binary sex and gender norms. Um, and so the term intersex has become associated with activism and advocacy since the 1990s. Um, and like I started saying at the very beginning of this talk, intersex is a term that can mean really different things to different people. Some may come to feel connected to the term as part of their central identity. For others, it would just be one part of their life experience. However, the inclusion of intersex within the rainbow or the LGBTQIA plus can hold its tensions for some. So parents and doctors who have negative beliefs of queer and trans communities may resent its association. And it also doesn't sit right for those adults with VSC who identify as cisgender and heterosexual. Um, and we've got a quote here from Dr. Regina Sterling, our co-chair from Intersex Aotearoa. Another problem is the assumption that all intersex people identify as rainbow, while some people may identify as such, many do not. Even when policies or funding include the I for intersex, it generally is a name only and does not enhance the lives of intersex people. So there's work to do within the rainbow about holding um, the I better. And like we, we like to say, I is not for invisible. Um, so what is the difference between trans and intersex? And this is really important because I think we find as we're moving more and more into um, there needing to be cultural care and cultural competency around gender affirming care, um, sometimes we hear healthcare practitioners conflating the trans and intersex communities. So holding the, the differences and the parallels is really key. So Transgender, of course, is an umbrella term that refers to individuals whose gender identity differs, differs from the sex they were assigned at birth. However, or as well as intersex is a term used to describe individuals who are born with physical sex characteristics that do not fit typical definitions of male or female. And you can see a correlation here in this quote. Even after years of criticism from intersex people, many providers are quick to perform surgery on bodies of babies and young children that they consider abnormal. 
at the same time, they hesitate to act in cases where trans individuals request surgery. So to be really clear, you can be trans and endosex, so not born with a variation of sex characteristics. You can be trans and intersex. You can be intersex and cisgender. So when there's a combination or confusion between the experiences of transgender and intersex individuals, it can pose challenges when developing appropriate healthcare plans. So intersex and trans people's needs can and do align. Both communities are asking for the bodily autonomy they deserve. Both represent natural ways that diversity can show up in humanity, but holding those differences between our communities is important too. Um, and now we're going to speak about a te ao Māori perspective, um, as a lots of the framing that I've shared so far is definitely sitting within a Western um, model. And so it's really important that we talk about um, the tangata whenua scholars and mataranga Māori leaders that are revitalising pre-colonial understandings of embodiment that sit separate to Western colonial framings. So Intersex Aotearoa co-chair Tube Chapman shares her experience by connecting her Māori whakapapa as being the most important aspect of her, as well as defining her intersex personhood as being intertwined with her era tangata. And we've got Dr. Elizabeth Kirikiri explores in her doctoral research on takatapui a reclaiming of pre-colonial concepts and the removal of Western projection of shame. So many hapu and iwi and Aotearoa tell of purako that speak of tūpuna that can be understood as having diverse sex characteristics. Some ancestors were carved into marae and celebrated. Of course, pre-colonisation, all members of the whānau were accepted as they are, yet with the colonisation of Aotearoa by British settlers, this brought British values, norms and knowledge systems, as well as their social, cultural, political, legal, scientific and medical systems. This Western approach to dissecting us up into individuals with distinct and separate body parts continue to be at odds with Maturanga Māori ways of being and understanding. So finally, hopefully I've given you a little bit of insight into where we've come from um, and where we're at now. And this is the fun bit where we get to talk about moving forward and how we can lead the change. So as part of um, the new health authorities, Te Whatu Order, um, there is an opportunity to reform intersex healthcare. And you can support that happening through um, upholding a rights-based approach to intersex healthcare wellbeing. Um, and that is being created in leadership with intersex-led organizations and individuals. Um, what we'd love to see is um, support from within healthcare, you know, really, asking for intersex advocates to provide insight and resources. So you, you could be seeing that within your mahi, within relationship and sexuality education and policy development and inclusion um, and to underline nothing about us without us. What we'd love to see is for you to feel more confident to talk to your staff, colleagues and practice about variations of sex characteristics and how as a clinic even, you could improve your intersex cultural safety. And that means all the way from reception to clinicians. Um, and you can let intersex patients know that peer support and connection to others with similar experiences is available to them. This could be through our organization or other variation specific groups. What would it look like to move just beyond cultural competency? So you can provide a patient's autonomy over their own body and well-being, and understanding that informed consent is an ongoing process. This never ends. You can help participate in the removal of negative framings and pathologizing concepts within healthcare. And hey, we need your help. It has to come from the inside and also from the outside led by community. You can introduce holistic understandings of health and well-being by thinking outside of a purely clinical framework. And, you know, always asking yourself the question, how can you develop relationships with these vulnerable communities you seek to serve 
and how can you provide leadership and guidance opportunities for experts within them to assist in the change. And let's work together. As I said, there's simple ways that you can support uplifting people with diverse sex characteristics. And that is, let's start with language. So stick, stay away from um, mutation, disorder, defects. Instead, try natural variations, diversity, and of course, sex characteristics. Um, and I really want to underline that the ideas pre presented here are just one way of thinking about intersex and people have their own feelings about how being intersex relates to them. Remember to follow each person's lead and mirror how they want to speak or not speak about their body feelings and journey. And consider how colonial and Western ideas of bodies affect us all and uphold ableism. Let us all challenge our own transphobia and question how endosexism may be evident in our work. There's kind of simple key things you can do, um, which you can start today. You can read the Darlington Statement um, that's on our website uh, and you can sign as an ally and you can even commit as a workplace. You can challenge the silence, isolation and shame of intersex people by exploring how we all uphold body norms and bring an end to endosexism in your life. One small way could be like, let's stay away from small dick jokes um, and just any assumptions you might have about people's fertility and reproductive systems. Um, and acknowledge that if there's parental anxiety, support parents to understand more about their child's variation and that we can connect them to those with lived experience and other parent, parents who have been in similar positions. And parent support groups are a great, great way to connect to others. And most importantly, you do not have to be an expert in intersex variations. What we need is for you to support the person in front of you and their whanau and to make sure that they understand all the risks implications and benefits from a range of options. So as I said, um, there's some resources on our website, check it out. Or if you have more questions, you can talk to me um, at info at intersexaltero.org. So I'm going to stop sharing and um, maybe we can bring back Yay, the that team. was extremely helpful, Jelly. And part of me wants to just let you have a minute after that much talking. <laughs> But I also want to jump into the questions that we've had come through. Um, shall I, uh, and Moira, feel free if you have thoughts to weigh in on answering these questions as well. I have one um, from a youth health worker or someone who works in a youth health clinic asking about seeing young people come in to the clinic who technically would fall under the umbrella of intersex or have a variation of sex characteristics. But, and I think the implication is nobody's talked to them about this before. And how can this person to do it, sort of talk about it without pathologizing or being like, we're in a medical context and I, I don't wanna inadvertently pathologize this situation further. Do you have thoughts on, it's kind of about language use, isn't it? Yeah, and it's also bigger than that. It's sort of like, um, it's that idea that because this isn't already held in any way, shape or form socially, you know, there hasn't been like um, little clues mm. along the way for anyone. Mm. We don't always, um, one, know how to speak about it or how to absorb that sort of information. Um, you know, we, we have young people reaching out to us really upset about, um, reckoning with themselves, feeling like they don't really know who they are anymore. You know, it can really shake people. Mm -hmm. um, for some, you know, I know for me, um, having that term after years of isolation and loneliness was really amazing to be given the tool of intersex. But for others, you know, for whatever reason, they might have heard certain ideas about it or they might have associ special associations to them where they might think oh I don't get to be me anymore I'm this other thing mm -hmm. um it can be a lot to take in so I think like you said it is so much about language it's about making sure that um any term that is as gifted is one that they can connect to and that could be a range of different things it doesn't need to be intersex yeah. but um that 
there's there's there are ways to make it strengths based, but also understanding that that just might take time for that person to to reckon with. Mm. Um, yeah, like like giving them a sense of flexibility and possibility rather than uh, the kind of diagnostic thing of like this is the certainty, you know, I feel like there must be a way of talking about it. That's like, you may or may not find this useful and here's Mm. the medical framing of it. And obviously like people are pretty familiar with the idea that medical framings of things are not always how the communities we live in would talk about those things. So you could probably be fairly transparent about that. Moira, did you have more to offer on that one? Yeah, I was just thinking about how, um, I think especially for young people, the way that they have into the topic might be, through a medical lens, like the information they have might be through a diagnostic label that they've been given by a doctor and maybe the only information that they've got is about that particular kind of medical condition or that label that they have. And I guess one thing I wanted to offer was just thinking about um, kind of holistic well-being and where this fits into a person's kind of overall sense of self as well. Mm. And thinking about mo- models like Te Whare Tapafa, like um, the idea that if you're supporting someone with their well-being, it's not just about their physical health. It's not just about like figuring out what they, what physical label to put on them and what medications or interventions that they might want to access. It's also their kind of mental well-being and like um, how this mm. might relate to any kind of stigma or judgment they're facing in their life and their whānau relationships and how they're connected with potentially intersex whānau as well, potentially community connections who might feed into that sense of well-being and it's that wider side as well it's like people's sense of who they are and their own sense of kind of belonging and kind of purpose and place in the world Mm -hmm. so um yeah I think it's just yeah part of it is approaching it as not just a like a physical health condition Mm -hmm. but but part of someone's overall life and well-being that was beautiful should we move to another question Jelly you okay with that yeah thanks that was very on point Moira um, we have a question from someone saying if if an endosex support worker has an intersex client, what support would you recommend them providing other than connecting with an intersex support worker and maybe intersex community where possible? So I guess you're an, a support worker and you know that you're an endosex person. Congratulations, you know what that word means. That's like quite a great step. Um, Jelly, thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited in the way that, that it's phrased and like the fact that you're a reflective practitioner where you're sort of going, or oh, cool, like, am I the right person to be doing this engagement? I, I would say, yes, you are, because, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're checking your processes. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, like I said, just engage with the person in front of you um, and find out what their needs are and also use your privilege of your position to access all the tools that they can't so you know that might be Mm. um helping support people to connect to others um you know if this is a a lot of information for someone um and you know let's be frank there's not it's it's not clear how to navigate through this there's not brochures and waiting rooms and um you know there's not easy guides so um you know supporting people to to move through those pathways to connection um whatever they might be whatever's right for that person um mm. yeah you need support in that eh? it's, it's mm. it can be really um intimidating and overwhelming so if that's within the range of of your practice um i think just being there for for that journey would be awesome and i have another question that i think maybe moira might want to weigh in on too um it's about te fatu order and um the way that funding works from bodies like Te Whatu Order, thinking of sexual health in particular and how talking about sexual health um, and reproductive health is binary, often framed as like male stuff and female stuff, I feel like. So how can we shift that or what can we do to be allies, this person is asking, be part of that shift for the intersex community in Aotearoa when we're coming up against those really rigid categories in like a healthcare funding kind of context? It's a big question and I know we don't have time to go a deep dive, but if Jelly or Moira have comments on that. It's kind of, I want to say just work with us. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like work, work with Intersex Aotearoa, get in touch with Jelly, get in touch with Moira or myself at Tingaku Kahukura. Mm, 
Yeah, it is a really big question. And I think what came to mind as you were talking about it was also that this is this is a real issue for intersex people and it's also a real problem um, around trans health as well, the way, the way a lot of medical problems get kind of gendered in ways that are not that helpful. Um, and it's a problem for queer people who might have different issues around reproductive health than what gets tended, tends to get assumed through um, some of those services. I think like a lot of services get quite are quite normalizing around the idea of like um, heterosexual paired couples and the idea that everybody might want babies at a certain stage in their life. And lots of medical decisions are really um, kind of normalizing around that model. Um, so I think there's probably lots of uh, allied conversations that could be kind of connected together um, that might support um, support that work. I think it's not just an intersex struggle. Yeah, I would I would support um, that. Um, I really think that what we've got again is um, an opportunity to think more holistically about how our healthcare services work. Um, and I know that many of you in healthcare are, you know, you're overworked, you're doing a lot. Now there's this huge big overhaul. People are having to reapply for positions. It's a stressful time. And so when we come skipping along and saying, hey, te, te to order, isn't this exciting? I know that it could feel like, you know, we've got some blinkers on, but what um, what we're looking at is actually like pathways in for the first time that could have community leadership driving some of that. And, you know, it's a big job. We're talking years of work. We're talking generations potentially. So um, I think being in relationship alongside that, so we're not putting all our eggs in that basket. We're actually like, hey, we need all of you to work with us. Um, we're we're small, but like I said, fierce. So you know, we we need we need help. We need you on the ground putting in place um, as much of of mm -hmm. our insights. And it's something to do with, um, I want to say legitimacy and professionalism as well, that community support and community organizations are recognized as having a role to play, but often not recognized as being experts or having expertise. And often we are the same people who are helping to write the guidelines, who are creating the pathways, or hopefully we want to be at that table, we want to be part of those decisions. Of It doesn't have to be just the people in this webinar right now. There are lots of people doing that kind of work. So recognizing the role that organizations can play um, is, is a complex one, but very relevant. And we're going to talk more about that on Thursday in relation to trans health too. Mm. Shall um, I move? Oh, you go, Jelly. Oh, I just wanted to uplift as well. We've got Denise Steers um, yeah. in the chat. Um, and I wanted to say they've done amazing work um, building relationships with parents, young people, and healthcare professionals all within um, intersex healthcare. Um, and the framing that Denise uses is variations of sex characteristics because that's just less, less loaded than the intersex term um, for lots of parents and young people. So, mm. yeah, um, kia ora, Denise. Makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, I've got a question about emergency departments. Um, we've had a, a fair amount of contact from people working in ED at Tingaka Kahukura lately. And the question is about what can emergency departments do to support intersex people? Or well, what are the main events that occur in adult ED that might be the most problematic for an intersex person or for the intersex community? Um, um, hmm. Yeah, I think it's hard because there is no homogenized uh, yeah, so I think just thinking about intersex as a demographic is helpful. So you might have people that present um, with variations of sex characteristics that are, you know, like their um, secondary sex characteristics may seem, I don't know, different to you. You might not yeah, know. Different how, than you what know, you expected. Yeah, you yeah. might not know how to language some things around pronouns um, or... I don't know, like Moira was saying, lots of our healthcare is really binary about, you know, how you engage in certain stuff. Um, and I would just bring it back to informed consent. You know, if someone's um, in a position where there, uh, there's been an emergency, they're super vulnerable, um, 
and especially if that's someone who has experienced like traumatic things within healthcare settings just and mm. um, you know that we were talking about very potentially serious PTSD um there's all sorts of reactions so I think um being compassionate not making assumptions and just really being hyper verbal so really like ongoing verbal checks with people mm. um you know but obviously again this isn't just helpful for intersex people this could be helpful for anyone um with you know mm. um who's trans or even experiencing mental distress um i think that being sensitive to a diverse set of needs um and not making assumptions about what they are sorry yeah. that's not clearer but yeah it's, it's sort very of... clear and being responsive to any information you get back or being just even if you're not getting a lot of information back um but you're sharing information to someone or maybe for periods of time they're not conscious so they can't speak back to you but being really aware that you might need to change at some point you might need to adapt how you're thinking about this person and how you're referring to this person based on at some point they might give you that information so just being aware mm. that things are not um you're going to make assumptions you're going to make some assumptions because that's what we do but be mindful that that those might need to change and if you're just willing to hold that it's a it's, it can be a challenge but a very useful thing We've got we've got more questions to get through. Shall I keep going? Yeah, I'm okay. loving it. Um, what work is being done with tertiary or primary care settings to ensure intersex individuals are received safely? And this is especially in frontline health crisis situations. I mean, there is work happening, but we are hoping you will help us do more. Is that jelly? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's there's been work happening in Aotearoa for, you know, over 25 years, but there hasn't necessarily been opportunities or pathways. And we've really had a lot of um, running into pretty serious brick walls. So mm -hmm. honestly, each time we run a re webinar and we have questions from someone like you, this is, this is a first, this is, you know, mm -hmm. this is a radical point in time. So just honoring that, yeah. There's, there's conversations happening, there's relationships being built, but also this can be a point of connection. This mm. can be a moment where we can um, say, well, yeah, do you have an idea about how we can ensure that within tertiary and primary care settings that um, there can be a consideration around responses um, for intersex people feeling safe? Yeah. So um, thanks, Alice. I, I'd love to talk more about that um, and maybe, you know, it's, it's all those kind of components that will fit into the overall um, holistic approach of, of Te Whatu Order, hopefully. Mm. And I loved that diagram that you shared of the holistic approach with someone with a VSC or, you know, in that center of the picture and getting support and information from a range of different places and that Fano were also getting support from a range of different places that, you know, like that, that visual I think will be, will be really helpful for people to try and understand the kind of change we're hoping is possible. You know, it's, uh, that's, that's not the way the system currently works. Um, it is visionary and we do need Intersex Aotearoa to be leading that process because, you know, you're the ones who know how that can be set up best. And, and that is personal expertise, but it's also professional expertise. That's community expertise, bringing those things together, I think. All right. Um, I also want to acknowledge there's somebody asking about um, collaborating on a guide to endometriosis, specifically thinking about the intersex community. That's a relevant thing. We will follow that up after this webinar. Thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering if we can do a final thoughts round and then we'll be pointing to some more resources, doing some wrap up and telling you about upcoming webinar opportunities as well. So I can go first with this, give, give you both time to think about your final thoughts. You know me, I just start talking and then see what happens. I learn a lot every time Jelly presents anything to us. Um, I really appreciate the clarity of your presentation 
capturing kind of the history of how we got here and particularly positioning colonization as being really a crucial piece in that, um, trying to get the medical system as a whole to reckon with, you know, the biomedical system or paradigms of knowledge being just one way and like a valuable way, a useful way, not a bad way necessarily, but just one way that has caused harm in some cases, trying to get that kind of, um, I feel like I get responsiveness from individuals who work in that system, but it's very hard to change the wider institution. And I am hopeful from the number of people who have come to this webinar and the number of people who are engaged in this conversation that we can start to, yeah, really acknowledge that the harm caused by colonization and the medical system that's been imported here is, is all relevant to intersex health and trans health. You know, that this is, yeah, that piece is really sticking with me. So I appreciate that, Jelly. You're unmuted. Do you want to go next in your thought? Leave Moira more time. Um, sure. Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm still battling with Siri in my head. Like, you know, <laughs> can't believe that she popped in like that. It's so rude. <laughs> to talk to her afterwards. Um, but yeah, I think there's always, obviously, more to say. Um, there's lots of people that are contributing to this. Um, and there's a legacy that comes before me. Um, and I'm just one piece of that. Um, and you know, I think. Um. I guess I've probably thrown a lot at people today. Um, and so we will be making these slides available if you want to take time to sort of move more slowly through it. Um, but also this is just <laughs> the tiniest bit. Um, and, you know, I really look forward to being able to unpack more variation specific work in the future um, in ways that, that people, um, might sit and feel and experience things outside of the way that I've discussed them today. So um, just, I guess, acknowledging that while like we are trying, we are very much leading this space that um, there's, there's no sort of set um, definitions for, for anything and that, that people and experiences and, um, and I guess movements and communities are shifting and changing all the time. And we'd really love for you to move along with us. So kia ora. Kia ora. Thanks, Jelly and Joey. And I think my final thoughts are about colonization too. <laughs> um, and thinking about Jelly, you were acknowledging Dr. Elizabeth Kirikiri and her work around Takatapui identities and her thesis work that she did, um, which she called part of the Fano, and just this understanding and knowledge that kind of pre-colonization that kind of queer trans intersex people, people who might fit outside of these dominant paradigms were just part of the Fano, and they weren't necessarily kind of separate words, separate language, um, but just that we had a valued place. And I think about um I was doing some doing sort of a historical art project a couple of years ago looking at um stories of trans women, of Māori trans women in the sort of early 20th century and late um, 19th century. And one of the stories I found in a old newspaper was about an um, intersex person and he'd died in his 20s from a medical complication. But um, when, and the coroner essentially was looking at what the causes were and found out that he was intersex. And talking to his whanau, his mum said that um, she'd never taken him to be examined by a doctor because she was scared that he'd be taken away from her. And I think, um, yeah, that's sort of the, that's the challenge we have is like, how do we, um, how do we reduce those barriers? How do we, um, yeah, get rid of that kind of that fear and that expectation that, um, that medical systems might pathologize people, might um, take away their choice about how they live, take away their kind of tangatira um, tanga over their, themselves, but also their, interrupt their kind of whānau relationships and the place that they might have in their life. So that kept coming to mind as we were mm -hmm. talking. I just wanted to mm -hmm. that as a final thought. Kia ora. Kia ora. And at 12.59, uh, we are wrapping up and we are so grateful that you were all here with us 
we have information in the chat for you about signing up for future webinars. We have one this Thursday, we have one next week on the 25th as well. Very relevant to this kopapa and in a kind of broad way. We hope that you will join us for those as well. Moira, can I ask you to close us with karakia since you opened for us as well? Just want to acknowledge uh, the huge amount of collaborative oomph and, and generative joy that I get working with Moira and Jono and Jelly and making these spaces possible. I'm sure we will have many more as well. Thank you. Kia ora, and I've just put a slide up on the screen of our upcoming webinar in a couple of days if you want to join us again to talk about trans health. But um, yeah, thanks again, all of you for being here today, for being part of this conversation, and I'll just close us with a karakia. Uh, me karakia tato. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapunui, kia wā, tia, kia māma, te ngāko, te tinana, te wairua i te ara takata. Koiara e rungo, whakaire ake ki runga, kia tina, tina. Uie, tai, kia. Kia ora. Thanks everyone. Kia ora. Go well everybody.